Bonjour, mon petit chiffre, Amber here. And I'm in the same outfit as the last video. <laughs> so it is December 29th that I'm sitting down to film this, right? Sure. Which means we're in the last few days of December, the last few days of 2020. This dumpster fire year is almost over. And we can start a hopefully less dumpster fire year. The one where I'm allowed at least possibly out of Pennsylvania at some point during the year, God willing. That's beyond point. So that being said, this is this is the time for reflection. The time where you you rush to your favorite channels or my channel <laughs> to listen to us of the book book world reflect on our reading year, review our highs and our lows. I've already done my lows, so now we are going to sit down and review the highs of 2020. It's time to go over my best reads of 2020. I'm so excited to talk about this list. The intention was to write, to do, to pick 10 top books of 2020. I cheated a little bit, two ways, because there are like two or three little bullet points that have more than one book. They're, they're ranked together as one. And then there are a couple that are not books, but series. Deal with it. Much like my most disappointing reads of 2020, I'm working my way up to the top from bottom to top. Am I? I guess, yeah, I guess so, to a certain extent, I'll say to a certain extent, there's not much order, except for, there's not much order, but I had to rank them for the sake of the video, you know? So, the first, I'm, I'm not gonna waste time, I'm just gonna jump into it, I've already been talking for way too long. The first, the first one's two. I couldn't choose, when I was listing, I'm like, what's number 10? I couldn't choose between these two, so I'm saying both of them. So technically we have 11. And they are We Are Not Free by Tracy Chi and Like a Love Song by Abdi Nazemian. They are nothing alike. <laughs> we Are Not Free is one of my most recent reads. I read it this last month, this month. I read it this month. It was my second read of December. And this book follows 14 Japanese American kids who are sent to incarceration camps. So it's a historical fiction YA novel that takes place during World War II. Like I said, it follows 14 kids. Most of them have grown up together their whole lives in Jap Japantown in San Francisco and their lives are uprooted and this follows them throughout the duration, that's what I'm thinking of, of their in incarceration. I'm using incarceration because like the term we most frequently use is internment, but this book was it it was it was heavy at times. It was really hard to get through at times. This book I as I I haven't talked about it yet because um I haven't wrapped up December yet but I said in my notes that this is this is that book for people who like to act like one America suddenly stopped being great when the orange was elected in office you know they want to turn the make America great again and act like he's what made America what it is or now that Joe Biden is president-elect that America is now great again it wasn't great <laughs> like ever this is the book for them this is another another book for them I should say so this is who America is and has always been there's a quote in the book that I wrote in all caps in my on my quote page it's like tyranny is American I, I was intimidated by 14 POVs, <laughs> but I think it's also important that there are so many POVs because even though like they're everyone, all of these characters are like within a friendship group, they all have different 
experiences and different like thought processes different feelings regarding their situation and different ways of handling it in different ways uh, and they have they eventually all go on different paths as they grow because like we grow with them we grow up with them essentially there was a good chunk of the book where I was crying like baby <laughs> I think it was beautifully told. I um, haven't read. I don't. I think this was actually the first book I I actually read about Japanese incarceration, and I definitely, I definitely want to study more about it. I want to read more books about it. There's a list in the back of in the end of this book that has more resources about uh, for research and whatever. So I'm definitely gonna pick my way through that list. I've read a ton, I've talked about this, of World War II historical fiction, but somehow I haven't, I, I think it's probably because like it's easier to read about atrocities done in other countries, even though I clearly obviously know what my country is. It's still just like, oh, it's hard to see what your country does to its own people, its own citizens. And then we have like a love song, like a love song by Abdi, at Jesus, like a love song by Abdi Nazimian. This book takes place in the, in the New York, in New York City. At the end of the 80s, it follows three characters, Art, Reza, Reza, Art, and Judy. Reza is just moving to New York from Iran by way of Canada, Toronto I believe. He and his mom, and his, well his sister's in college, he and his mom are moving in with his new stepfather and his new stepbrother and he is holding in the secret that he knows he's gay but like all he knows about homosexuality or being gay, gay culture, whatever, is what he's gotten from the news and that is not great because this book play takes place during the AIDS crisis. But he is struggling with his sexual identity he, where, and then he meets Judy and they become fast friends. She falls in love with him and her best friend Art and this is just like a story of love and accepting who you are, becoming who you are and resilience and all these things and I almost forgot to include this on the list but then I, I was watching one of my videos it was it a wrap-up when I read the book or something whatever and I just remembered how much I loved the book for a minute I almost gave up on the book because Judy's POVs were really starting to get on my nerves if I'm being honest but towards the end it really came around it really broke my heart at some points. I, another one where I was like sniveling like a baby. I definitely think YA books that center HIV and AIDS are still so very important. I think some new people are still so uneducated. There's still such a stigma around it. And also this book in particular, the history of that time period and the the gay rights movement it's still very relevant it's still very important there's a lot in the book that i read i'm like wow nothing's changed in this department or you know not very much has it's like there obviously have been like waves and strides but i don't think that's a phrase but there's still so much to go okay so let's let's move on so next is this book kind of took me by surprise it's kind it was a step out of my comfort zone actually but i had heard so much high praise for this book and it's the weight of our weight the weight of the stars by kay angram who's also the author of the wicker king and this is like a a contemporary sci-fi i think is the proper term that follows ryan is that her name who's always loved space and is obsessed with space and dreams of going to space but like she kind of has pushed those dreams aside because she kind of has like responsibility to be there for and take care of her brother and his baby and they're from like the wrong side of town. She meets this new girl, Alex, Alex, Alexandria, whose mom is on this like lifelong mission to the edge of space and like her birth was like a whole scandal. She every night 
uses like radio frequencies to try to communicate with her mother in space. Alex is like a really angry, withdrawn person. And Ryan is like kind of asked to, kind of asked to like take her under her wing, bring her into the fold of her friendship group and like, you know, try to help her. And then uh, things go awry and there's an incident in which Alex is injured and Ryan has to basically help her every night get up on that roof to communicate with her mother and then it's like their connection, their friendship and then like a this is a really cute like love story and I didn't expect to love it as much as I did. I don't really read like sci-fi which is ridiculous because I too have been obsessed with space my whole life. When I was a kid, the two things that really made up my personality was like dinosaurs and space. Nothing's changed. So the fact that like there's a whole genre I leave like kind of like on the wayside. I don't know. I don't know. I've never, I don't, maybe I'll make that one of my goals for 2021 to try more sci-fi. Anyway, so I didn't expect to love it as much as I did, but the, there's such a beauty in not just the story but just like the way it's written i became so attached to all of these characters there was a point i don't remember the exact page number i could probably find it honestly page 277 on i didn't stop crying until the end this book was very bittersweet but like i said here in the best way and it made me desperately need to read the wicker king which is on my T 2021 tbr k ingram also kayla also has a, a dark modern peter pan retelling coming out in 2021 i'm like you rang okay so next is a sequel to one of my favorite books one and this is one of my most anticipated books of this whole year and it was blood and honey by shelby mahern which is the sequel to serpent and dove this book was something <laughs> it was a ride i have a lot of thoughts i can't really go too much in detail because i don't want to spoil anything but i there's a lot there's a lot that i want that i okay i love i love that lou and reed's relationship was challenged in this book like over and over and over in book one it's like okay we have the enemies to lovers thing and then they kind of you know recognize their attraction pretty pretty soon and you know like boom they're in love with each other and this book kind of challenged that it yes they're married but then they kind of just had to work for their love I guess there's a point where it's like questioned whether or not it's like real or if it's just like a you know more like a sexual or physical attraction between them and these two these two put me through a lot they one i i said this every time i've talked about the book that they exude such so much rick and evie in the mummy returns energy you guys would get so much done if you focused <laughs> if you just like keep your hands off each other for like a second they, each of them are battling themselves so much in this book. They lose dealing with like so much trauma and it's manifesting in not in some really unhelpful ways for you know driving the plot and getting things done. Reed is grappling with this new ele these new elements of his identity and his past and not handling it well he has, he has to reteach himself a lot of things you know relearn a lot of things unlearn a lot of things and he is struggling Reed kind of got on my nerves a lot during this book they both got on my nerves but I'm like Reed I get it I get you're going through a lot but please stop being irritating please please <laughs> but I, I love the, that we're out of the tower we're out in Caesarine we are there's a slew of new characters there's Coco and Ansel my baby my sweet boy my little bird I love Ansel I love that Coco is actually like a character now she's so important to the plot Bo Bo is such so much such levity he is my favorite type of character 
that like i said the levity the one who flirts with anything walking my favorite characters like that those are my favorite characters fennec altair Bo. um what did i just read oh musa from the ember books those are like those characters own my heart then we have like so many other i guess mythical creatures coming into play it's not just witches we have the loop guru the werewolves i think in book three we're getting mermaids there's uh the spirit i don't know i don't remember what he's called of the forest who's like it's like you know the the head honcho and far as like this god almost he's very much aslan i'm just i'm just excited about how this world is being expanded and the story is being weaved book three is gonna be a lot because the end of book two was so much it was so much and i thanks shelby but book three is gonna be something it's gonna be something but i'm excited for it the next sticking with witches i read these books back to back actually in the opposite order the next book is another one of my most anticipated of the whole year and i was not disappointed and it's the year of the witching by alexis henderson which follows emmanuel who lives in this patriarchal puritanical society called bethel she her mother okay so okay let me break this down. Bethel, which is run by the prophet, who, you know, sp has gets his visions from the father. There's like the father and the dark mother or something like that. Like I said, patriarchal. Bordering Bethel is this haunted wood that is haunted by the spirits of these witches that were killed back in the day by a former prophet. Was he like the first one? I don't remember. Emmanuel's mother has ties to the woods and the witches and her mother is dead. Emmanuel is like an outcast in her society. The only people who don't treat her as such are her family. She's raised by her grandmother. Her grandmother, her grandfather, and his second wife, his other wife. So basically, long story short, plagues come to Bethel and Emmanuel is basically the only one that can stop them from destroying everybody in Bethel. He's assisted by Ezra who is the prophet's son. He is the heir, the next one to become the prophet. And I think he's adorable. I think he's sweet. And he is not who he is. I was pleasantly surprised by his character. I loved this book so much. I This is my first book that I read for October for spooky season. And I, it was worth putting it off for all the months that I did. It was dark and witchy. The plot tackled and called out patriarchy and white supremacy didn't mention that Emmanuel's uh biracial her f father is from like the outskirts of Bethel where like the black people live which is another reason why she is treated like such an outs uh outsider in her community it was it's so atmospheric I it gives me strong crucible vibes or um what is that movie called is it called the witch the one with the goat I think that's what it reminded me of a lot. So I guess Scarlet Letter vibes. There, there's, there's still they, they burn witches. Did I mention that they burn witches in this in this world? People have compared it to Sabrina, the Chilling Witches of Sabrina, and I definitely agree. If it was like a Prudence storyline, which I would also like, I love this book. I need book two. I need to know what happens next and how, cause like it's not over. Obviously, the book left off on this like hopeful note, but I'm like y'all please i want to know what happens between emmanuel and ezra going forward the story is not romance heavy at all but there obviously is like a attraction between the two of them and i support it ah yes next we have a twofer with a little asterisk we'll get to the asterisk in a second <laughs> it's get a life chloe brown and take a hint danny brown by the one the only the queen talia hibbert i read get a life chloe brown that was the first book i read this year actually i had it for a while and my mom kept bugging me about just like so when are you gonna read this book don't forget you have this book hey did you read this book yet so i'm like all right let me just read this book and i think i read it in like a day and a half or two days <sighs> and i still haven't shut up about it <laughs> 
and it like set Talia on the fast track to being my favorite romance author book is everything it follows Chloe who is she I think she she works in like tech like computers or something I think she designs websites or whatever and she is that black queen who also lives with fibromyalgia my mom has fibromyalgia so I think I think she needs to read this book at the beginning of the book Chloe almost sees like a near-death experience which leads her to make this list of things she like a bucket list of things she wants to do before she dies because she realizes that she hasn't really done anything with her life and to complete this list she enlists the help of Red Redford <sighs> who is the superintendent of the building that she lives in and also her neighbor because he lives in the building as well he is a secret painter also and I love him so much like I said she enlists his help to complete this list after they get over their little tiff it's not quite enemies to lovers it's kind of like I guess miscommunication each of them I think it's like each of them takes sarcasm too seriously Chloe has this like air about her where she puts on this almost like an armor and kind of tries to ward off people wow that sounds like someone else I know who could it be though I don't know but I love this book so much I love this book so much I love Talia so much and then that brings us to Take a Hit Danny Brown which is you know the follow-up the companion novel which follows Danny who is Chloe's younger sister <sighs> she I think she's she's a teacher but also she's worth studying something something with science I don't remember she's like super smart another fat black bisexual queen Danny is, <laughs> is something she in this book that her what she wants is a nice little little f buddy a little romp a romp partner if you will and not just anyone she wants Zephyr I mean girl same who is the security guard at the building she works in and they have like a nice a cute little work friendship he's in love with her already at the start of the book the fear is a former professional rugby player and he also has this program with with his best friend where they teach like teenage boys rugby and also also how to cope and handle their feelings and mental health is a fear has severe anxiety and is also dealing with like grief long story short after a an, in, an incident where Danny gets stuck in the elevator at work during a, a like a drill and Zafir rescues her carries her out bridal style and the video goes viral and they are dubbed Dr. Ro Rug Bay across the interwebs which leads them to a fake dating situation which will help benefit Zaf's foundation organization whatever it's called and like all she wants out of it is to sleep with him I mean I get it you know fake dating Zafir <laughs> there's one thing Miss Talia Hibber can do she can write a love interest I think I've fallen in love with everyone that I've read and there's been quite a few because I have been working my way through Talia's books this year I love these books so much I love the sister dynamic I love each of them individually I find myself in both of these characters I love the men that Talia writes I love Red and Zaf with my whole heart I have I have Redford and Zephyr candles in my shop. That's how much I love them. <laughs> I'm obsessed. That's really that's really all I can think to say. I remember hearing people start reviewing Take a Hint Danny Brown and talking about how it was even better than Get a Life Chloe Brown. Like that's not possible. And then I read Danny and I was like, oh my god, how does it get better? How does it get better? I don't understand. I, when I read Chloe I was like I would follow I would read a whole series just following her and Red I honestly would I love them I love Red so much he is so sweet and caring and like, attentive and <sighs> and then 
staff a man's and i just love i love the representation of the book i love that as far as chloe the there's like the the disability rep the fibro rep and and then uh the anxiety rep with with the staff that was i felt it i felt it was very like accurate and just uh uh and then the, the way there's this one this one scene where he's having a panic attack and just how chloe not chloe danny handles it i'm just oh 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 these people these fictional fake people own my heart and then little asterisk because like i said i have been working my way through talia's works there i have to mention i can't not mention one of that I don't remember when I read this. It was somewhere between the two. And <sighs> this one follows Jasmine and Rahul, who have been best friends since college. The whole time Rahul has been in love with Jasmine. They had one moment in college where they, they slept together. And Jasmine basically gave him the ultimatum. Like, either we're going to keep doing this and then like but nothing else or we're going to be friends and he chose to be friends and he chose to be our best friend and i'm just like oh my god <laughs> so long story soon there is a an incident in uh jasmine's apartment the apartment's flooded and she has to move in with rahul I could not include this. I couldn't pretend that this wasn't a favorite. Aside from the Brown Sisters books, this is my favorite Talia book. Like Talia, I haven't read one yet that I haven't loved. I've I've started keeping a list. I'm ranking them right now. Also, where did I get a Rahul? I would, please, if you could find me a Redford, a Zephyr, or a Rahul, please. I think I deserve that at this point. I loved him so much. Oh man. What was that noise? I just... Like I, I mentioned with the Brown sisters, I find myself in like every one of Talia's main characters. There's just something that I relate to. I just... And then I fall in love with all of the love interests. So that's... That's that. Actor Age Eve Brown comes out in 2021 and I can't wait to get my grubby little balls on it because I know it's going to be perfection. I know it is. The next is a series, not a book, not a, but a series, a full series that I read the whole series this year and it's the Dave Bad Trilogy by S.A. Shocker Bordy. The City of Brass was on my 20 books to read in 2020 or whatever I called it list this year and then I think I went above and beyond because I read the whole series. <laughs> The final book, Empire of Gold, came out a few months ago, so I had to read, I had to, you know, read it all, especially because I had, before even reading the books, I had pre-ordered the Fairy Loot set, yeah, Fairy Loot set of the trilogy and the Fae Crate Hangover Recovery Kit, because I just knew, one of those books, one of, well, the first one was one of those books that I knew would be a 5 out of 5 that I'd be obsessed with, and I wasn't wrong. I, I fell so fast so hard so fast for this series for these characters i became so attached to all of these characters nari and ali i wasn't sure about ali at the beginning i was like all right all right little prince boy but by the end of the series i would fight for him i would i would ride or die for alizade for, for prince alizade like i I'm irritated because I have a full spoilery reading vlog of me reading the whole series but the first two books the content from the first two books are on a hard drive that doesn't want to connect with my laptop right now so I don't know where you're gonna get that vlog like I said I knew I was going to love this book it just has all the elements that I love in a book I love some uh, what is it called desert fantasy this book the beginning of the book where Nari's in our world takes place in Egypt. Okay, let me break. Nari, in the beginning of the book, Nari is a con woman living in, in Cairo. She accidentally summons a jinn warrior, ancient jinn warrior, and is whisked, whisked to Davabad, this ancient city of brass, of uh, jinn and deva creatures. I don't, 
she finds out she is the fi the last in a family of Dave uh, healers and she is moved into the palace where she meets our other POV in book one, Prince Alizade, who is the second born of the the king. His brother, Montadir Diru, is set to be is next in line. Ali is his aide. I still haven't figured out how to pronounce that, which is basically sort of like bodyguard, second in command, one of those things. Uh, there's a lot of political intrigue. There's a lot of drama. Uh, Nari is navigating her way through court basically. She and Ali basically are using each other but then their friendship turns into something real. I don't know why I'm still summarizing this book but you know the book's going from there. I just another one I just became attached to all of these characters. By the end of book three I was not okay. So the book three Empire of Gold was such a satisfying conclusion. Everyone was where they needed to be. I mean, of course, there were some a lot of bittersweet moments, but but it felt it felt right when I when we ended the book, and I am just very thankful to have it in my life. Okay, so next is a book I had had kind of been putting off for years now. I finally did it. Uh, it's by one of my favorite authors, auto by author. And it's Monday's Not Coming by Tiffany D. Jackson. Tiffany D. Jackson is one of my favorite authors of all time. Anything she writes is golden. Monday's Not Coming destroyed my life. <laughs> like, I'm not even joking. Oh my god. I mean, honestly, going up from here, all of these books just like completely destroyed me in one way or another. This book follows... What's her name? Oh my god, I can't remember. Claudia whose best friend Monday has gone missing and she's the only one that seems to have noticed and this story follows her trying to find Monday. It's a story basically highlighting how many black girls go missing and no one does anything about it. No one looks for them and they're just lost and they're just allowed to be lost and this story like I just said wrecked me it ripped my heart out Tiffany is the queen of a plot twist right so there's the one twist that I saw coming but then she hits you with this other one I'm like are you okay ma'am I was completely shaken to my core reading this book and like I couldn't stop thinking about it for the longest time and this is why when I read Allegedly, when I read Allegedly I was intending to read Monday's Not Coming right after that. We're just going to pretend that's not ringing. So I was intending to read Monday's Not Coming right after that. I couldn't. I just, because my spirit was like disturbed. So yeah, I had to take a long time to recover from this book. Have I properly recovered? I don't think so because bringing it back up I just like viscerally feel everything I felt at that time. Oh my god. And now I have to read Grown and just... Jesus okay but yeah my day's not coming if you have not read that book please do yourself a favor and well do it when you're emotionally like ready because it is a lot it's taxing there's it's, it's just heavy and painful and just ooh, tch, ooh, ooh. but it's magnificent Tiffany's writing is magnificent speaking of books that destroyed me I read two the final two in a series I started last year and they have become the series has become a favorite of all time and I'm talking about Soul of the Sword and Night of the Dragon by Julie Kagawa which are the second and final books in the Shadow of the Fox trilogy. I read I started reading Shadow of the Fox I keep telling the story every time I talk about it. I started reading Shadow of the Fox in like maybe the spring of 2019 and then I put it down finally picked it back up I think in like December and fell in love with it and I every time I think about the fact that I almost gave up on this series I could I could punch myself in the face. Soul of the Sword and Knight of the Dragon. This series is so underrated. I I don't know what I don't know what more I have to do <laughs> for you guys to take me seriously and read these books. Every time I get online I don't see fan art for these books. I don't see anyone talking about these books I'm like why don't you care about yourselves I I have loved watching the characters Yumiko and I was a Okami but you know not him Tatsumi my god grow 
throughout the series and become more in touch with their humanity. I loved this cast of characters growing into a family and by the time I got to book three my heart I cried. Right I don't know what I was saying my hammer died she said girl you talking too much but I think I was still babbling about Soul of the Sword and Night of the Dragon. Book three ripped my whole heart out and like I said I cried for a good chunk of it so in conclusion please do me a favor and do yourself a favor and read these books so I can talk to you about them and then what a segue do yourself and myself a favor and read this next book we'll read the first book because this is a sequel to another favorite underrated series and it's Wild Savage, Star Wild Savage Stars by Christina Perez which is the sequel to Sweet Black Waves which is a Tristan Isolt retelling that I read 2018? 2019? One of those. I have talked on and about this book, this series, these books. I love them so much. I have been emotionally tortured and wrecked by these books. I have shed a lot of tears over these two. I didn't think a book could hurt me. I didn't anticipate that this book could hurt me as much as book one did because book one, Sweet Black Waves, was not very sweet to me <laughs> in my heart. But Wild Savage Stars was wild and savage to my heart. <laughs> yeah, it's like you're here and then just took me here. I didn't get a chance to breathe for the duration of the reading period of this book. These characters are all going through it. Branwen, oh my poor Branwen, deserves so much better. Almost everyone in this book deserves so much better than what they are dealing with. And by almost everyone, it's because we all know that I hate Essie, I hate Isolt. And that, that didn't cease or change at all in this book. In fact, I think it got worse. Mm. I, I have so many conflicting conflicting feelings regarding Tristan and Branwen. I still have hope for them. I know it's stupid, but I still have hope for them. I was supposed to read book three, the final book, Bright Raven Skies, this month. I was going to finish the, read the two series finales that I have. I read one and then I'm still recovering from it. So I'm like, I'm not going to I'm not even going to try to read that book right now, so I'll probably read it in January. Start my year off with a good little cry, probably, because I know, oh, I know. I need y'all to read these books. I need you to read these books. These characters are all so complex, and I think, I've mentioned this before, I think this is the first time I've ever read a book where the main character is both pro protagonist and antagonist, because so much of what Branny is battling and struggling with is herself and a lot of the the unfortunate situations that everyone has is going through is essentially because of her. Yeah I can't wait to see how this this series concludes. I'm kind of intimidated by the ending and kind of want to put it off for as long as possible but I'm not going to do that. I just need to I need to rip off that band-aid. Speaking of rip, ripping off band-aids the next one is another one that, what did I say before? I don't remember. Was it Go Big or Go Home? I don't remember what it was. Whatever it is, it's my, it's another series. It's my new, newest favorite series of all time. And it's the Ember in the Ashes Quartet by Saba Tahir. <sighs> Book one and Ember in the Ashes was also on my TBR for 2020. I received it last year's birthday gift from Ashley at Pages in the Stars. And I finally read it in, I finally read it in May and then I read it for Asian Readathon and then had to continue and I read the entire series this year. I just, five days ago now, finished the series. On Christmas Eve I concluded the series and read, finished reading the Sky Beyond the, uh, Sky Beyond the Storm. These books, <laughs> when I finished this series, the first thing, the like the main thing I kept thinking was I hate the fact that I will never read these books for the first time again. This series is the type that sticks with you forever and it's so poignant and moving and has, I feel like I've been changed by reading these books. Sabata Here's writing is 
otherworldly impeccable the, this world these characters these relationships the message behind it, these stories it's the series is both like uplifting and heartbreaking and just everything 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 to me i love these characters so much elias victorious is my my heart i know i've said that about so many people but it's so true i loved watching Laya come into her own going from like this girl who's so ruled by fear to this you know powerful woman warrior Ugh. I even grew to not completely hate Helene and just I'm gonna cry <laughs> I'm trying not to cry I filmed one thing I kept saying when I was reading this story is that I wished I had started a reading vlog when I read book one but I did go ahead and film one for the final book and there are a lot of tears. I have to edit it. It's just oh, my heart and just reading the series. Someone to here could release a book of grocery store receipts and I'd read it. I'd buy 15 copies and I just I just hate that I'm done. I, this is the other series finale that I was talking about when I said I have to finish these two. I chose that one. I put it off. I got it. I got in it but I was like trying to at first I was putting it off because I didn't want I didn't want to be done I didn't want to be finished the series like I said because I this is the last time I will read these books for the first time and just let me stop let me stop talking before I start crying I feel it and I have actually I actually have eye makeup on today so let me stop so that is it those are my top books top reads of 2020 I will say I, I did have quite the reading year I, i've had like an impactful reading year because so many of these books are going to stick with me forever so yes let me know one if you've read any of these books not just this year but in general like what do you think but what's your what were your favorite books of 2020 what books you're looking forward to in 2021 i'll be discussing that filming those videos hopefully soon probably tomorrow thank you for watching thank you for sticking with me this year thank you for sticking with me for however long you've been here i appreciate you if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you like me, feel free to subscribe. All my places are down here so you can follow me. And I'll follow you back. And I'll see you very soon.